Kia ora, everybody. A very warm welcome and good afternoon. Uh, Richard Clippin here from the Financial Services Council. Uh, welcome to our um, discussion around money and new generation rent, um, our uh, panel discussion and launch of research that uh, was released uh, on Tuesday. Um, it's 3.31. Um, thank you all for joining. I'm hoping that everyone is um, well, um, home in their bubbles, um, and uh, kind of come to terms with the fact that we're a bit back in lockdown, which for some of us is uh, difficult and painful and for others enjoying the quiet. Um, th what we did last year and what we'll continue to do through lockdown uh, this time around is continue, up, uh, continue on with the communication, the sessions, the webinars, uh, th things that are of interest um, almost as a new business as usual uh, which I'm sure all of us in our own particular businesses and worlds are doing. Uh, just turn on the, the COVID-19 process and, and away we go, uh, notwithstanding the broader context of friends and family, both here and internationally, that might be doing it pretty tough. So, folks, with that as an, as an introduction, if I might, I might uh, just to set the scene, what we'll try and do in the next hour um, is just set the scene on the research I'm going to just take you through some of the key highlights and headlines. Um, and then what we're going to do is I have the great pleasure of a fantastic panel uh, and we're going to explore some of these uh, uh, conversations and topics in detail. Um, I did obviously want to call out the fact that um, if there's any of you on the line who was due to come and join us in person on Tuesday afternoon when we had a full proper event um, uh, hosted by DLA Piper with drinks and connecting uh, with 45 minutes to go. We knew the news was not going to be good, so we pulled a pin on the event. So if you were at the show or planning to be at the show or en route to the show, apologies, um, but we thought, look, this is the next best thing. And so with that, um, I might just uh, ask Hayley to move us on to the, uh, the next slide. Um, this conversation obviously is very interactive. Um, for those of us who know Zoom well, Please feel free if you've got any questions, you want to have a chat, uh, just use your uh, chat button uh, at the bottom. And uh, as we go through the panel, we'll be looking to try and answer some of the questions and observations that are turning up. Um, I wanted to do a big shout out to the FSC Research Committee. Uh, it is a committee of the FSC that helps create, shape, drive and uh, produce um, not only this piece of research, but all the research. Uh, a number of that committee is on the line today. So just a huge shout out to you folks because just, just exceptional work. Uh, I also wanted to uh, thank uh, trustee executors uh, who continue to support the FSC's uh, research process through now 2021, uh, but also last year, allows us to collectively shine a light on uh, issues and topics that are of interest uh, to all of us in the sector and, and more, more, more particular, uh, and more particularly get a, a really good handle on what's going on in New Zealand and how consumers are thinking and feeling about their lives, their money lives, their KiwiSaver lives and so on. And, and again, we'll explore some of that. And of course, I did want to acknowledge uh, DLA Piper's uh, willingness to host our event last, uh, uh, last Tuesday, which in the end didn't quite uh, take place, but really appreciate uh, their involvement and willingness. And in terms of who does the research for us, uh, Core Data is our research partner. They're a, a global uh, research organisation headquartered out of Sydney. Um, and uh, this piece of research is based on just over 2,000 New Zealanders living right around the country, ages and stages, income graphs, income brackets. All the data is in the back of the uh, research paper. So I'll commend that to you when, uh, when you get there. And uh, we might, on that note, Hayley, just move on to the next slide. Uh, which is just providing a little bit of a snapshot of uh, of who Generation Rent is. So um, all the research that we've done, we've typically tended to take a, um, a product segment lens to tell a story, whether it's a KiwiSaver story or a financial resilience uh, index story. This story is very much driven by a demographic, and this particular demographic are the under 40, so the 18 to 39s. And what this slide does is just give you a little bit of a flavour of who they are, uh, the breakdown between uh, men and women, 
um, those that are in home ownership and those that are not, really designed to give you a little bit of a flavour. I won't get into it into terribly much detail on the basis that you can see it all, um, other than to say that there's roughly around 1.5 million New Zealanders in this age category, of which about 40% currently own their own house uh, or their own property and 60% don't. And when we come to the panel, we'll be trying to unpack some of those particular conversations. We might just move on to the next slide. Um, so one of the things that we tried to explore here was to understand some of the day-to-day uh, -day finances, both uh, assets and debt. And what you can see out of this slide uh, is that um, a, for a significant uh, um, number of this uh, community, um, th there are there are uh, sitting between uh, zero and one hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of assets. There's a significant proportion of this part of the community that's saving their money in this type of world. Um, it does include KiwiSaver. It does include things like their online investment platforms and term deposits and so on. So the the notion that this this part of the community doesn't have assets would be wrong to impute, uh, but it's then what they do with it and how they how they invest it. Um, if you have a look on the on the other side of the slide, which is uh, the household debt, gives you a pretty good indication on what's happening on that side as well. And obviously, for this part of the community that does have uh, property debt, you can see that that playing through. Haley, we might just move on. Um, so one of the headline pieces of this research was to really unpack um, how do New Zealanders broadly think and feel about um, the rise and rise of property prices? Um, and we, we broke that down and how worried and how, how concerned are people about it? So you can see there's um, in the very dark uh, orange, very worried, somewhat worried, not particularly worried in lighter green and dark green, not worried at all. And if you just step back from this slide, what you would get a sense of is that across the country, we are concerned about the rise and rise of property prices and ultimately what that means. For those that are in the market, uh, you know, it's a two-edged two sword because, of course, as, as asset prices grow, if you're a beneficiary of that, well, happy days. But, you know, for those who are thinking not about, not only about themselves, but about their families, about their kids and their grandkids, you can kind of see that play out. And the number, the number sitting in the 18 to 39 age group is obviously pretty stark. Uh, that was pretty ranked pretty big in the in the headline, uh, the headlines that ran through the media. So kind of really interesting to see the level of concern and ultimately what that means in terms of behaviour uh, and actions. Hallie, we might just move on. Um, so again, a really interesting slide here about uh, several things. The top, uh, the, the first graph I just wanted to call out um, is around. Um, the notion and the connection between the well-being of people and their long-term financial security and owning property. So, of course, the question was, uh, to what extent is buying a property the ticket to long-term security? You can see that play out for people. It has been, is a truism that um, great security comes from, from buying property, and that's why it rates so highly. Uh, on the positive side, if we head to the, to the next uh, question, which is property prices in New Zealand are affordable to the average Kiwi, uh, turn it on its head, uh, is property becoming unaffordable? You can kind of see the dark orange and the lighter orange playing through into well over 80%. And I think that's where a lot of the concern is coming through. Um, if, we, uh, if we go to the next, the, the, the next uh, question, which was, are younger Kiwis, thanks, Haley, are younger Kiwis getting... Uh, locked out of the property market, again, um, uh, very strong support for that notion. Uh, and that's not only in the age category of generation rent, but across the whole community. Um, um, and then that last question, uh, which I'll, I'll play on, is, is the New Zealand dream of, of home ownership no longer attainable to the average Kiwi? Again, for most in the community that, statement was true so those are uh, uh, you know on the, on the on the plus side we know that property rates uh, really highly as a ticket to long-term security the rise and rise of property prices pricing a lot of people out 
means there's a great deal of depth of anxiety and great concern. And what we've what we've what we know about most of this research now that we've built up a fairly big picture is that the money conversation is not just about money. So it picks up things like mental health and well-being, uh, about how people feel about themselves, about their goals, about whether they're in control or not. So so you know broaden this conversation out into a broader conversation about money and how you feel about your goals and achieving things in life, um, you can just kind of start to uh, start to see what's, uh, what's playing out. The last two uh, pieces of this particular slide uh, is the, obviously the political question, so who should be doing more about it? Uh, on the one hand, the government, on the other hand, the banks and the financial institutions. I won't head into either of those two particular topics other than to say that the data obviously is pretty compelling. And I think, uh, I think uh, we'll go into the panel discussion in a moment, but you can kind of see why house prices and first home buyers and who has and who hasn't is not just a financial issue. It's a, it's a New Zealand issue. It's an economic issue. It's a social issue. It kind of permeates right across uh, our national conversation. That's why this research, from our point of view, is really valuable to do and really valuable to shine the light on. Um, if I then um, uh, uh, just close out, Hayley, on the next slide, um, this this kind of just plays out some of the data points. I won't go into it in any great detail other than to say um, uh, the research is available on the FSC website, uh, commend it to you. Uh, feel free if you run a FAP or you're a financial advisor or in the media, you want to use it and, and use the insights for articles and share information, feel free to do that. It's, uh, it's, it's now a public asset and, uh, and, we, and we hope that uh, you find some, uh, some, some good use for it. Folks, that's uh, 343. That is a very highlights tour, very brief highlights tour, uh, deliberately so on some, just some of the key pointers uh, on the research. What I did want to do now is to, uh, on this particular slide, welcome our panellists uh, who uh, are going to share some of their stories with us and sh sh uh, some of their insights. Um, what I'm going to do first is, uh, it, 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 as with any panel conversation, it is a discussion. So again, to you, to anyone out in the marketplace watching this, if you've got any questions, please feel free to use the uh, chat button, the question button. We would love to uh, seek your questions. Um, I'm not going to introduce the panelists as uh, bios and so on. You can see their photos, you can see their titles, and you can see who they work with. What I will do is I'll actually invite them to introduce themselves. And perhaps uh, for, for starters, I might go to Ryan uh, Bessemer from uh, Trustees Executives. Ryan, kind of first question for you is, uh, what, why did T want to support this research? But, but also, what's your take on the broader topic of house prices, uh, generation rent, and what the future looks like? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Richard, and, and thanks again for allowing TA to uh, continue to sponsor the Money and You uh, series. I suppose for trustees, executives, as a, a supervisor and a trustee, our role has been for the last 140 years to look after the financial wellbeing for everyday Kiwis. And, and um, you know, property uh, is, a, is a really big part of, of that and, and um, you know, where we keep our wealth and, and usually our, our largest asset um, is in property and it seems like that sort of paradigm is changing and as you mentioned before this is really pertinent because it's about generations I mean those of us who already own property etc you know obviously uh, less concerned about increasing property prices but for our children and, and, and their children and so forth I mean we're seeing access to property uh, sort of diminishing and you know, whether or, that, or not that's a, a good or a bad thing is is to be debated, but um, you know, it's definitely part of the change in psyche that uh, we, we need to understand. Uh, I you know, my, myself, I've got you know I've got five children. Uh, I think about those five children and how they're going to get access into the property ladder, and and I you know, I definitely want it to be one of their goals. Um, you know, as they're coming out of education into career about what they're going to do about property. So. I think for all of us, it's got that personal angle as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Ryan. Kelvin, I'm going to go to you if I can next. Um, um, a, to introduce yourself, B, to have a crack at the question, but also perhaps to pick up the, um, the discussion that turned up uh, yesterday with the Reserve Bank's decision around holding interest rates and their view on house prices. 
But perhaps uh, first, first things first, uh, tell us a bit about your, who you are, where you're from, and your take on the topic. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. My name's Kelvin. I'm Chief Economist at CoreLogic. We're a property data and analytics business supporting a lot of the industries and involved with property or the sub-industries, I suppose, banking, insurance, um, you know, government, real estate. So we're, we're across a lot of all of that. And yeah, I guess um, we're always trying to provide, we're, we're independent, we're trying to provide uh, objective analysis of the market. So it's not, we don't have any particular agenda. Um, so we try and sort of talk about it as we see it. And for me, I think this 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 issue is, is absolutely massive in New Zealand. You know, it's a generational thing and, and probably the same for me around, okay, my kids are pretty young, a, a couple of kids are pretty young, but, you know, you do you do think about um, what the position for them will be in future and, and what housing affordability will be like and, you know, access to the housing market. So I think, again, it's it's that personal thing, you know, what, it's, it's all very well for, you know, I, I hesitate to talk about this or use this word, but, you know, the boomer generation, you um, it's all very well to think, great, we're in houses and, and that's great. But and, and everyone says, well, that, that wealth can just be recycled. But but it's not always that easy. You might have paid off your mortgage, but you don't suddenly have 200 grand sitting around in cash either, probably. So, you know, just, just casually saying, oh, well, the parents will pay the deposit, um, you know, not that easy. It might involve going back into more debt. So so I think there's a, there's a big generational issue here and it's it, it's a bit too casual to just assume that that wealth can be easily recycled. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of my perspective on it. So really valuable research and, and, and yeah, really thankful to be involved with the discussion. Um, so I've forgotten what the other issue was around house prices and interest rates. Yeah, yeah just, I mean, um, Justin, just, uh, sorry, Kelvin, your, just your take on um, the Reserve Bank Governor's announcements yesterday. Did it, did it surprise you? And um, both on the rate hold, but also on the broader property price question. Um, well, given the circumstances, I wasn't surprised that they held the interest rate. I mean, it would, it would seem a bit strange to, on one hand, have the government sort of, you know, uh, restarting the wage subsidy and, and trying to support the economy through that. And on the other hand, the Reserve Bank going and sticking up interest rates at a time when, you know, uncertainty is pretty high. So I think in the end, it was, it was, it was the right decision. It, it wasn't too much of a surprise. Um, but they certainly made the case very, very clear that they would have been raising interest rates were it not for, for the move back up to level four. So we've still got rising interest rates in our future very shortly. Ho- well, I mean, hopefully, again, that depends on your perspective, but hopefully from the sense that lockdown's short and uh, that you know we can get back to sort of some sense of normal really, really soon. Uh, and that, of course, will on the flip side, involve higher interest rates. Um, and in terms of house prices, yeah, uh, the the government, the, well, in their forecast, actually, in their monetary policy statement, that they, they've got um, a bit of a dip in house prices starting late next year uh, and, and running into 2023. Um, only talking about sort of 5%. And even that's sort of a little vague. Some of the language coming out today is... is um, Wow, it's a bit of a projection, a bit of an estimate, a bit of an indication of where we think things might go, as opposed to a, a sort of central forecast. And you sort of wonder a little bit, reading between the lines, whether it's yet another sort of risk mitigation measure, saying, "Hey, um, there's a risk of prices falling later out or further out." I don't think anybody disagrees with that, and it might be the Reserve Bank saying, "Hey, well, there's a risk. Don't overpay now because uh, there is a risk they might fall later." So. Um, I wonder if there's a little bit of sort of signalling going on there as opposed to an actual forecast, but um, have to wait and see. And in the end, you know, 5% probably isn't massive. Um, sure, if you say 5% off the off the purchase price for a first home buyer, that's great, but um, probably wouldn't make a huge difference for many owner-occupiers either because look at the gains they've already had in the last year or so on top of any previous years. So, um, yeah, I wonder if it's more of a signal than than anything else. Fantastic. And look, a lot of great questions coming through. We'll head to questions shortly. Before we head there, uh, Jen, um, you're, you're taking the topic. Uh, really interesting from uh, an interest in your, or in your view, um, both as a generation renter in terms of uh, kind of the generation that you're in, but also some of the recent decisions you've made. Tell, tell us your take on this topic. 
Yeah, completely. So first of all, hello, everyone. My name is Genevieve Mora, and I'm the co-founder and general manager of Voices of Hope, which is a mental health charity uh, where she lived experience stories. I'm 26 year old, years old, sorry, so I do fit into the generation rent bracket, and I'm also a recent homeowner. Um, so I'm really looking forward to today sharing my experiences on the impact on well-being, but also the conversations I've been having with friends and family, and also how I got into the housing market, because um, my parents were a huge support of that, and I'm not afraid to admit that. Um, um, and so really interested to, yeah, to share that all with you guys. Fantastic. Fantastic. Justin, uh, you're, you're taking the topic and, and welcome. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm a real estate lawyer and partner at DLA Piper. Um, been involved in the industry for a long time and uh, have seen real estate been knocked around quite a few times, um, including the GFC. Um, I think my take off the topic, I think it's really refreshing that we're all taking a bit of a pause and reflecting on where we've got to and where we should uh, head to. Really, it's a very in important topic. Far too often, we've been just too busy and preoccupied in providing the advice and doing the deals and so on. So this is a great opportunity. I'm really encouraged to see huge debate uh, in the public and private sector. It's a very impo uh, important topic. Justin, just, just on that uh, first point you raised, which is like any asset, things go up and things go down. Um, you know, there, there, there've been, as you point out, uh, periods of serious downturn in property, a bit of a pointer from the RB. And yet, if you've lived in anywhere in New Zealand the last couple of years, you might be forgiven to think that, you know, it's only a one-way uh, conversation that only goes up. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I, um, about a week ago, I tossed this idea around with one of my real estate partners in the office, um, Heath Brunton, and uh, we tried to narrow down how we got to this current position and, and, uh, and narrow the, the thinking down, really. And um, we kind of see it as an um, ecosystem in, 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 in the property uh, sector, in particular housing. And where we got to as you'd expect, there's one of supply, of course, um, but more particularly uh, quality supply. I was quite pleased to see uh, comments by, um, I think it was um, um, Mr. Andrew Crisp, um, saying it's about the, the right property at the right price and at the right location. So to, 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 um, to me and to us, it's, it's all about quality supply. And when you overlay that with periods, long periods of low investment in, in infrastructure, and you throw low interest rates on top of that, um, you would have to say the environment is quite conducive to the speculator or the investor who are, we think, competing in the limited supply. And there, there was the issue, I think. Um, and then you overlay that with COVID in recent years um, and all the challenges that that brings in terms of costs, um, supply chain, and et cetera. So you, you, you start to see the picture. But I, I think the, the core issue is real estate as, as, a, as, a, as an asset. Um, it's probably a discussion for another time, but it, it is, and some have said this before, it's a lazy asset. It's, you're not incentivized to deal with it. So you, you hold on to it. You keep it and, and the value appreciates. I think that's a core issue, but it's probably not the topic for discussion in this forum. Fantastic. Thanks, Justin. And plenty more questions coming through. But before we head there, um, uh, Riz, uh, welcome. Uh, tell us about, a bit about you and, and your take on this topic. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, my name is Clarissa, or Riz, um, and I work for the Financial Services Council leading our consumer communications and projects. Uh, and I also work very closely with our strategic research committee on research reports such as this one um, and essentially turning them into engaging content that everyday people can, can engage with and understand. Um, and I suppose more importantly for this particular panel, uh, like Jen, I am in that demographic of, of generation rent, um, smack bang in the middle, more or less, I'm 31 years of age. Um, and I'm also a renter, so I'm coming to you today from my um, my flat that I share with uh, four other flatmates, and yeah, lockdown's been a bit 
bit tricky trying to get everyone in different rooms and, and get some quiet space for, for this. So, um, but yeah, it's, I guess my take on this topic is I can lend this personal perspective, um, being part of, of this generation, um, you know, struggling to get onto the property ladder. Um, but also the, the cultural perspective. And um, I know Kelvin uh, potentially has some insights into this as well. We talked about it recently. Um, but I've lived in Europe. I lived in Sweden for about four years. Um, and the attitude towards home ownership over there is, is quite different. Um, and it's very much, um, I guess, this, this, this expectation in places like New Zealand and Australia that you, um, you, know, you strive to own a property and, and buy a house to have something of your own. Um, but it's not necessarily the case everywhere else. Um, so I'm quite interested in that, in that um, side of the topic. But yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Thanks, Riz. Uh, in fact, that's probably the first question. And I might, Jen, go first to you, um, having given you've just bought a place, is the research was pretty clear on this, which is around the long-term security conversation. But um, despite the price, um, owning a home is still a dream for everyone, in particular uh, the under 40s. Um, how come? Like, wh why? What, what, what's happening in your age group and demographic amongst your mates? Uh, around this topic? I think a big part of it is, which is um, what the report showed as well, was the financial security. I think for me too, like forward thinking, next steps, I want to have a family someday. And when I talk to my friends wanting to have families and um, I guess having a stable, safe environment for them to grow up in, but also being able to afford to raise the children. So I think that's a part of it. I know for me, since owning a home, I have felt I guess, a greater sense of belonging. Um, I also know or believe that owning a home is a privilege because I look at a lot of people around me and they're not able to do that. I have a lot of friends that are renting and paying a lot of money to rent with the dream of still owning a home. Um, but I do think it's becoming more and more unattainable, um, if that's the right word. Um, so yeah, I think it's a sense of belonging, a sense, sense of independence, and also like a next step kind of thing. I guess um, I was just thinking about the fact that growing up, I always dreamed of owning, owning a home someday. Um, and I'm very lucky to have been able to purchase my first home, but that wouldn't have been possible, or this home that I'm living in wouldn't have been possible um, without, you know, my partner's um, pay coming, you know, going towards mine, because we could get a bigger loan, also the support of my parents, and and the fact that we moved 30 minutes um, north out of Auckland to be able to get something that we could actually afford. Uh, so it's a conversation that I hear a lot about within my friend group. Um, and I look at the people around me and, and majority of the people in my, in my social circles who have bought houses have had support from those around them um, to be able to do so. Do, do you think you've got to have, is it a dual income necessity, do you reckon? Is that, is that how it's playing out now? It's an interesting thing. I've got a couple of friends. I was talking to one last week. She's 30 years old. She's single. Her dream is to own a home. She's been paying someone else's mortgage, you know, by rent and is not enjoying that process at all. Um, but she's a single income. And so there's only so much money she can loan to be able to afford to buy a house. Um, and that seems to be a common thing with two incomes. It does seem to be more possible because obviously there's more money going towards it. Uh, so, yeah, that would be my take on it. Cool. Well, we'll come to some of those well-being pieces that you mentioned because I think that that that's the non-money conversation that, that rings uh, really powerfully all the way through the research. But, Riz, maybe just back to you on this topic. Um, is, it, is, it, is it your dream to own a place um, or has your international experience kind of got you to question that, whether that is absolutely right for you in that regard? Um, I, I would say I fluctuate um, between two extremes. So... I, there are some days when I think, yes, I, I absolutely 100% want to own my own home. I want, it's sort of like Jen was saying earlier, you know, you want this place to call your own, um, particularly if I were to get to the point where I wanted to start a family, you know, I'd, I'd love to think that I could raise, you know, kids in my own home um, without that fear of potentially having to move. Um but it, I had a chat to somebody um, from a bank at sort of halfway through last year. I was just sort of reaching out to kind of get a sense of um, can I afford to buy my own home on a single salary? How, how long is it going to take? And um, it was really interesting because the first question that um, this person asked me was, why do you actually want to buy a house? Have you thought about that? And it really just made me think, why, why do I actually want to buy? And um, 
I feel like such a big part of it is this pressure from society and and this you know this whole norm or expectation of that's just what you do um and I just sat down and thought about it for for a while and kind of realized well is is that a good enough reason is that a good reason to actually um part with so with so much money um so I fluctuate I would say between really wanting to and then kind of questioning it and I think definitely that experience of um having lived abroad um and having that different perspective towards home ownership sort of informs that um so yeah absolutely thanks Riz um still great questions coming through and I'm almost about to go to them but I just thought I'd just um head to Kelvin on this particular topic for perhaps some the macro view on you know what what's happening with this age group about the buying and the want to get into property were themes and trends that might be turning up Kelvin yeah, I think um, just to touch on a few of those earlier points, um, you know, it's been shown to be, so quite apart from all the non-monetary benefits of, of security and stability, there's also a lot of research showing that, you know, um, future financial outcomes are, are, are better, that uh, financial stability is stronger for households in home ownership than than in rented properties. And so it's it's monetary and non-monetary. So those, those things are, those linkages are fairly well established um, the counterpoint as has been pointed out is is that well lots of other countries actually don't have as high home ownership rates as we still have even though as it's come down uh, they still have lower home ownership rates than us yet they're not they're not basket cases you know I'm thinking here of say Germany home ownership rate there is less than 50 um, Switzerland's less than 50 so um, you know that sort of goes against that research a little bit but I think probably what they have is is better um, legislation policy um, institutions around renting so you know tenant protection um, and um, other ways to generate wealth you know that's that's probably something that that um, certainly in, in amongst a lot of the regulatory changes made in the housing market lately there's been a lot of sticks for property investors um, but not a lot of carrots um, you know we could have seen things like I don't know tax breaks for Kiwi saver you know um, the tax incentives for putting your money into there, maybe less penalties if you withdraw early, that sort of thing. So, so, and that's a two-string thing as well. It's it's getting maybe people who would be investing prop in property to look at other things, therefore, you know, freeing up some properties for first home buyers, but also for those people who who may be in renting for their lifetimes, giving them opportunities to generate wealth outside property too. So. Um, there's a lot of those those big issues and big policy things to deal with, but they are some of the features of those markets overseas, where where you know you don't have to be in home ownership to to sort of generate that wealth. So um, yeah, this as I say, there's some pretty big issues there, but um, that, that's I think from my perspective, that's that's kind of the context. Um, a question's coming from Rob, uh, and a question around um, perhaps for all pan panelists, but the question around would we want to see house prices fall so that the access piece becomes easier for for, for generation rent? Kelvin, is that is that something that, uh, notwithstanding, we probably couldn't influence a whole lot individually? Are, are there settings and levers, perhaps that that government or bank bank could do to um, drive down prices in order for access to be uh, available or is it just the market's too big and too unwieldy? Um, I, I think there's probably a too big to fail scenario going on in here for for the whole economy, financial institutions, banks, um, everybody. There's sort of a, a lot of vested interest here, and, and you know the government has even I think just in their Ardern said pretty much they don't want to see house prices fall. They just want to see growth moderate a bit to you know below wage growth so that you can slowly restore affordability over time so yeah I, I think um again sort of pointing to bits of research here but i think the financial stability uh issues that would be created by a, a sort of house price crash would outweigh any benefits to a certain group of society like aspiring first-time buyers i think that that's sort of reasonably well accepted so um we probably don't want to see a crash but but i think you know sustained moderation actually i think was the phrase that that just in there i do use so over a period of time you want to see house price growth below wage growth so that it can sort of slowly um, adjust and, and and restore some kind of affordability there but um <clears throat> also 
first point out that uh, there's obviously, and you know, acknowledging there's a lot of uh, disappointed aspiring would be first home buyers. Um, but but our figures, our buyer classification numbers actually show that there's been a lot of successful first home buyers lately too. And um, in fact, to the point where first home buyers' share of the market in the last year to 18 months has been as high as ever. Um, you know, you're looking sort of 24, 25% of the market. So first home buyers have actually been successful, um, you know, acknowledging some haven't and, and um, that's that's what we're talking about, but but a lot have too. And, you know, they're tapping the bank and mum and dad, they're using those um, lending speed limits to get in with less than a 20% deposit. They are um, using KiwiSaver. Uh, comp, you know, it's been talked about compromising on the location, the type of property. So uh, I think, but it, it plays into this sort of psyche. And I don't know where this came from. I, I can't explain why we have this uh, sort of trust in property and, and that's very different from other countries, but it, it, it's there and I can't explain why it is or why it started or where it started, but it, it is part of the, the Kiwi dream and, and I think people will still try and aspire to that um, you know, within whatever environment they're operating in. So um, I think it's, yeah, there's, there's always two sides and um, some have, have been priced out, but some are still finding ways in. Justin, I might go to you on that same topic if I can. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think with any measure you, you introduce, you, there's always a trade-off. So I think um, what we're seeing is um, if the question is, should there be more direct intervention? Um, the short answer in my personal view is not. So it's all about trying to maintain, trying to maintain the right balance. Um, as to why we have uh, the, the dream in this country and not others, I've asked myself that question many times, um, I, and I, I, I think it probably comes down to historic, of course, and in in time maturity of the market. We've got to find alternative investment opportunities, um, which uh, this conversation mm -hmm. and what we're debating generally uh, should uh, unlock, really. Um, and the quality of rental properties, I think that's very important as well. Right. Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Um, just I'll just jump in there on the type of rental property too. That's that's a difference yeah. overseas. You know that that build to rent, whatever you want to call it, institution institution <coughs> owned um, stock. That's that's really there for um, you know long term renting and reliable um, secure tenancies. So, but we're moving towards that. You know, look, we've got record dwelling consents, and a lot of them are uh, townhouses. Um, I guess, you know, obviously destined for the private ownership market. But, uh, yeah, there's, it, it probably is a question here of the right type of property too. Yeah. We might come back to that one, Kevin. Ryan, I just wanted to go to you on this one and perhaps also bring in the, you know, the notion of KiwiSaver and other platforms about, um, you know, for the under 40s, how do you create that, that amount of money so you can actually get into market? Um, we had a look at the micro-investing platforms. There's a KiwiSaver conversation. What, what, what's your sense of that? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking just going back, first of all, on, on, on what Justin was saying before, I mean, you know, supply is a really large part of this issue. And, and But to, secondarily, I mean, we're, we're looking at the, at, at the research and part of what we see out of the research is you know, there's substantial amounts of debt uh, in, in, in the market. A lot of that is credit card debt and there's... Uh, if you going through the, the chat here, there's a lot of questions about things like discretionary spending. What are people spending their money on? Are they saving? And that comes back down to the idea of um, you know, the education around saving and, and, and financial well-being needing to be something that we teach our children. Uh, looking at that KiwiSaver, it's a great way to start thinking about you know, that, that journey into financial well-being and, and learning at an early age uh, to be able to, to, to save. Yet um, we still struggle with this idea of, of, about just thinking about KiwiSaver as just retirement, but it helps us, you know, it will help our children get into the property market earlier and, 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 and so forth. But, um, you know, obviously um, go, coming back to, you know, what we've spoken about in, in other parts of this research over the course of the last few months is you know, number one, how much are we contributing uh, and continuing to contribute to KiwiSaver? Is it enough, both for home ownership and for retirement? 
Uh, number two, uh, um, it's still not compulsory. Do we need to make it compulsory? Uh, and you know, three, one of the other big thematics we've been talking about is this concept of of, of education around uh, uh, around saving and and getting to that at an early age. So I mean, I, I think there's you know, out of everything we've been talking about over the last few months, I, I think there's a number of things that, that we come back down to, and that is um, you know, being able to teach our children to be better savers. So that, that's interesting, isn't it, Ryan? That whole, and it, you're right, it's played through everything, the financial literacy component, the financial education. Um, you know, the research is pretty strong on, you know, it, it's not just this generation, it's our generation, previous generations. You know, you've got to sacrifice. If you want a goal, you've got to sacrifice for it. You've got to save for it. You've got to target it like anything in life. It doesn't just happen. Um, and that's kind of really playing strongly through the research, isn't it? Yeah, and, and you know, part of that is you know, learning to avoid debt and, 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 and so forth. So it's not just about and savings and education around savings. It's around it's around how you manage your financial you know, uh, your financial uh, affairs uh, in all. I might <coughs> just uh, excuse me head to um, to Jen because that that window into the bank of mum and dad and the family support conversation I think is a really important one. Um, and, and Jen, without getting uh, too too into your personal story, uh, unless you particularly want to, that you know, how important is the bank of mum and dad? How key were your folks and your family support network to kind of help you think that this was a goal you could achieve, and then perhaps help you enable some of it, perhaps compared to some of the the views around your your peer group? Completely, I consider myself one of the lucky ones. Um, I come from privilege and I was able to have the support of my parents so prior um, to um, moving into our house we actually my partner and I um, Isaac we moved into my parents house for about a year prior so that we could save money so the first bonus there was that I had a family that could house us for a year and help us save during that year um, which I know really is a privilege because it's not the case for many people um, in terms of the deposit um, on the house that was something that they also helped with um, I know my partner Isaac I actually was quoting the, uh, the stuff yesterday saying that he was a terrible saver um, but he found KiwiSaver really helpful because he was putting money towards something without really realizing he was doing it uh, and so that was a big help there too but I wouldn't be living in this house and I'm happy to admit that if it was wasn't for the support of my parents uh, they were a crucial part in allowing me to do this and I think like we've heard from other people they wanted to help with that because they wanted to get me on the property ladder um, I'm aware how lucky I am with that but it was also the um, ability to move in with them prior to save and I look at a lot of my friends around me and they don't have that option uh, some of them don't have parents that are able to support them many of them are single and only have one income stream um, and it really is affecting their well-being and their lives. And Jen, was the, the the question around financial capability and kind of learning about money and to Ryan's point, learning about debt, mm. was that something that, that you came to later or was that something that you kind of grew up with? I feel like I'm still learning that. To be completely honest, that's something I wrote down before because there was um, a question around, you know, what can we do about it? And I think there needs to be greater education. I feel like I am still being faced with things that I don't know how to deal with. Um, this is going to sound really terrible, but even a mortgage, you know, dealing with that and, and seeing the the hefty price of a mortgage and, you know, learning about having to pay that off. I don't feel like I was educated that well. Um, I think my parents did the best they could. Uh, but, yeah, there's definitely more work that needs to be done there for individuals in terms of saving and debt and everything. There's a question there. I think it's um, relevant to what you're saying, Jen, is um, uh, Murray's asking, did you use your KiwiSaver to, to, to purchase a property? Yes, yes, I did. Yeah, and since then I've moved my Kiwi Center Kiwi Saver percentage down, um, but I think I was on the highest percent for a while, trying to put as much into my Kiwi Saver as I could. But Kiwi Saver, um, mine combined with my partners, was a big help in terms of us buying our house. Fantastic, Chris. I'm going to go to you on the same conversation because um, I know around the FSC water cooler, we've tossed this discussion around. What, what what's your sense of it in terms of your pathway either into getting the property and your support around you and, and you know, the, the kind of money, the money conversation. Mm. Yeah, I think um, certainly too, I, I've also been very privileged um, and I'll, I'll acknowledge that as well. Um, 
I I don't have, um, I guess, the bank of mum and dad that I can lean on. So it's um, probably, yeah, it's mainly me that would be saving um, for, for a house. And that's what I've sort of been doing for the last probably five years or so now. Um, I'd say it is much harder to do on a single salary. There's some... <laughs> Sometimes I've kind of thought to myself, oh, it'd be so much easier to just join forces with with someone even if, and I know um, a lot of people are doing it with with friends now, that's kind of trending as well. Um, people sort of going, going in on property with friends or family members. Um, personally, I think for me, KiwiSaver's um, a, great, a great tool. Um, I would love to see, I mean, that being used more um, I think it's fantastic um, but I also have turned to other things um, and some of the research that we did recently showed that um, a lot of younger Kiwis are sort of having the same um, same idea and, and moving into other sort of investments so um, I've started investing in the share market and, and using micro investing platforms and things like that just to sort of diversify a bit but also because still in that situation of not knowing you know am I going to end up buying a home or not so um I still I think a lot of generation renters we want to grow our money we want to use our money and do something with it I I would argue very strongly against this idea that we're lazy or um you know those stereotypes that kind of go around that we just spend all our money on avocado and toast and all of that I think um we try really hard and we do the research shows we do have investments you know um I think 83 percent of us do have investments and so we've got money there it's just yeah we're looking for other ways to use it um and I think for me investing it some of it in KiwiSaver and some in other investments is a way of um kind of going okay well maybe I can use it for my first home maybe I can use it for something else potentially but at least we've got that that option there um and yeah KiwiSaver is a great tool particularly for me on a single salary and and without the the support from from parents did you see any benefit of using, um, say, a micro-investing platform over KiwiSaver? Is, is there a particular reason why you use a micro-investing platform for savings? Um, I think so. I, I use micro-investing platforms. I also have some money in managed funds. Um, I think I like spreading it out a bit. I, I don't like the idea of having all my eggs in one basket. And I think just the idea that I could tap into it if I wanted to is is quite appealing. Um, I think KiwiSaver for me has always been, and this is something that my dad instilled in me from the age of like 15, was, you know, I was living in Australia at that time, so it was superannuation, but, you know, it's for your retirement and that's purely what it's for. And I think I've got that ingrained in my mind that's for retirement and so the the home stuff now it's it's only really changed recently that you can actually access um kiwi saver to to purchase your first home so maybe it's just taken me a while to kind of wrap my head around it but um yeah i just i think that there are so many other investment options out there and um i guess i, I like to sort of try different things so yeah, that, that's great, Riz. And you're right. The smashed avo uh, piece uh, <laughs> has uh, unjustifiably labelled some generation renters as hanging down the beach and just eating flash food, whereas actually the research was reverse on that. Um, all the things that you and Jen have pointed out: savvy, tapping into your resources, investing widely, uh, creating plans and options uh, to get where you need to get to was much more the truth. I, I thought I might just. Um, uh, Justin, head to you and Ryan just for this co- part of the conversation, which is around the role of advice. Um, and perhaps uh, Ryan, start with you. Like, um, you know, we all we all end up at a point, and then uh, you know, getting advice, whether it's from a professional advisor, there's lots on the end of the line today, uh, or perhaps from your, your family and so on. What well, what role does professional advice play in helping people get the right uh, program in place? Well, I think as as, as Riz was saying before. Uh, um, this this concept of diversification, I think that's you know, a you know really great one. But where do you know really to put your money? Um, you know, KiwiSaver is a great place, but obviously you can only take it out in certain you know, times and life events. Um, micro investing platforms are easy. 
Um, Pi funds give you some tax concessions, uh, but really, I mean, to 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 and different a- asset classes will at you know, certain times within the within within the you know, times within the economy will give you different rates to returns at, at, at different times. But to be able to judge all these things together, obviously, I think you know, the idea of going to a financial advisor who understands the the peaks and troughs and the eccentricities of the markets and so forth to just, just make sense and it, it builds on that concept of diversification. Uh, so t- to me, I mean, I think there's a, a huge place for it. And we think of advice as what you do is you accumulate and then you go to an advisor and saying, what am I going to do with my money? But what about the idea of going to you, advisor saying, I want to accumulate, what's the best way to mean to do that, and I think we don't think um, we don't think about that scenario as as much. Thanks, Ryan. Justin, your your take on the advice question? Yeah, yeah, and those are very good points, Ryan. I think it's also important for the advisors, the advisors, to adapt and um, recognise that we are or whoever's providing the advice is dealing with a, a, a different set of demands. I'm very pleased to hear, Clarissa, it's, it's about um, alternative investments and so on. So your horizons and your needs um, are changing and evolving. Um, so the advice needs to be tailored and recognise that. That's the most important thing. Fantastic. I'm just going to, there's been a lot of uh, chat on the, on the conversation just around other models in, you know, other cultures. I just thought it might be worth exploring that a little bit further and then we'll kind of come back to the where to from here discussion. Um, just wondering, anyone on the panel, and perhaps uh, perhaps if I go to you, Kelvin, on this one, um, how come it, it is in Australia, New Zealand, where you know, kind of property is it's almost in the blood, um, whereas in other places it's like, no, no, you just need a roof over your head, and there are a bunch of ways to get it. Yeah, honest answer, I don't know. Um, I, some you could probably maybe trace it back to you know frontier societies or something. I I, I just don't know. Um, I was saying earlier that that how has this sort of psyche and mentality come about? Um, who knows? But I guess we just have to acknowledge it is, it is what it is. And um, you know, first home buyers still have that desire to own, and and you know we we still place a lot of value on on property. Um, you know, I was, I was really um, I was thinking sort of devil's advocate as as, I was, as the discussion was going around about diversification and, and other types of assets and getting into micro uh, micro investments and things. I was I was thinking, gee, this next generation is actually better off because we all know diversification is great. There's you know all the, the current investors in property um, probably just own property. That's it. Their own house, a couple of rentals. It's all in property. Um, so actually, who knows? A little longer term, this this might you know actually be a much better thing. But um, yeah, I'm probably dodging the question a little bit there. But I I just I, I can't explain it. I, I, something around what how it started, I don't know. But where we are, you can you can sort of explain the differences. You know, overseas better sort of legislation around renting and and these other investment options that we've talked about. Um, which you know could change the landscape here a little bit as well, and, and the type of property too. Um, so, if anybody else has got some uh, sharper explanations than me, that I'd, I'd love to know too. Yeah, because there was a comment on on the chat about you know whether people who rent feel like they're second class citizens when you kind of go capping hand to you know to find a rental place uh, in New Zealand compared to in uh, in other parts of the world. Riss, when you, when you were living um, in Sweden. Was this a conversation that turned up with your with your buddies around, uh, or was it just you know you rent you just that's what you do and you get a long term place and away you go? Yeah, I definitely had a lot of conversations with friends. Um, most of my friends were renting. I think it's quite normal there to to continue renting in your thirties and even forties. Um, it's just not. I think a lot of people do like to settle down, but it's just not the be all and end all. Um, so, yeah, it was just a very, very different, diff- different perspective. Um, and I guess it, it makes me wonder, and perhaps this is a question for you, back to you, Kelvin. <laughs> um, 
is is renting such such a bad thing? Do we, do we actually does generation rent here in New Zealand? Do we need to change our perspective and actually stop focusing so much on property? Um, that would I, I mean that's something I ask myself and I don't know the answer to it, but um, yeah, quite interested in in that idea of you know do we do we need to move away from it? It's, are these you know inflated property prices sort of pushing us towards you know other options um, and is that a good thing potentially yeah I um I must I must say I, I'm pretty neutral about this I, I don't think re- I don't think renting is is um I'm trying to think of the right way to say this it, it doesn't have to be a disaster or a road to ruin um perfectly legitimate tenure choice um I think what probably um, I think in the end, you know, maybe it comes back to that financial literacy, financial education, whatever. What a mortgage does is force you to save. And, um, you know, maybe for whatever reason, people don't have the discipline to, to generally do it themselves or maybe it's an education thing or, or whatever. Um, but when you've got to pay that mortgage every month, and I know you've got to pay your rent as well. It's, it's you know, pretty much the same thing. But, but you know, forced saving is, is something for me about a mortgage that, that, kind of gets you that that step ahead but inherently there doesn't need to be a great disadvantage to renting I mean it's perfectly legitimate tenure choice you avoid rates you, you avoid maintenance you avoid all of these things and actually when you're paying mortgage there's a heck of a lot of interest you pay in there too so um you know it, but I think as I said earlier there needs to be other other uh tack-ons to go with it you know better options for generating wealth outside of housing which you know has been taught you know you're doing very well by the sounds of it so you know that and maybe in the end it's it comes down to education and um you know maybe we see long-term change around the the legal structure around renting and, and other options for wealth creation fantastic folks we're at uh, 320 uh, 428 i'm going to close and invite each of the panelists for a closing comment jen i might just start with you just picking up uh, and so the closing question is, you know, wh- where are we going to be in five to ten years' time? Will the rise and rise of property prices continue and will this issue just continue on? And perhaps, Jen, if you can also perhaps pick up any of the, the questions around wellbeing that you touched on a little earlier and uh, we might then just whip, uh, whip around the panel and close. Jen, over to you. I mean, I hope they don't for the benefit of Generation Rent and us moving forward. I really like the discussion. It wasn't something I'd thought about before. Sorry, the lighting's terrible. Around is renting actually such a bad thing? It's really got me thinking a lot. So thank you for opening up that discussion. Um, I think in terms of well-being, we didn't get that deep into it, but a few people have mentioned it in the comments in terms of security. I know with renting, you can kind of be chucked out at any moment. Um, and also, like I mentioned, the, the worry and fear around um, long-term goals and plans, as well as the frustration around paying someone else's <coughs> rent. Um, I hope things do change. I think the biggest thing that I can kind of contribute is the um, the education. I hope there's more education for our youth and people, you know, in this age bracket and beyond around what it means to own a home and what it means to rent and how that is changing. I think um, a lot of the learning I've done has been on the way through the process of owning a home. Um, but I can say that owning a home has given me that sense of belonging. And I was actually talking to someone the other day who mentioned owning a home is almost like a status thing. It's almost become a status if you own, own a home which I think someone mentioned you know the second class citizen sort of thing um so I hope people do find yeah find a way forward um whatever that may be for them and I hope with that comes some more well-being tools and support around people's well-being um, while they're in the housing market or looking to purchase a home thank you Jen Justin yeah I don't think the market would change um, um as quick as we'd like it um to change but what I think will happen, and we're seeing it already, there'll be innovative thinking, alternative structures, build to rent is around the corner already here, instead of a build to sale, for sale. Uh, we'll see some risk sharing, some innovative structures, probably around leaseholding and so on. So I think it's positive. Um, the challenge we have is about scale to make a difference. And uh, yeah, the jury is still out on that, but it, it will change. Brilliant. Thank you, Justin. Ryan? Uh, I think there's going to be more and more demand, and uh, I, th- I think um, things won't be changing anytime soon. You know, the ASB is saying that there's 
you know, ten percent further growth this year, another five percent over twenty twenty two. That'll that'll equate to you know, fifty percent increase over the last three years. So um, I think if you're existing home buyer, fantastic. Or home owner, it's fantastic. But you know, as a buyer or, or someone trying to look to get into the market, um, you know, the, there's going to be continued challenges. Thanks, Ryan. Risk. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with Ryan there, and I don't think it's. I don't think these rising house prices, house prices are um, going to end anytime soon. Um, although the Reserve Bank seems to think that they will come down at some point next year. Um, I mean, the research that we just released. I mean, it shows that even though everyone, a large majority of New Zealanders, seem to think that you know housing is unaffordable. Um, we still have this idea that owning a house is a ticket to long-term financial security. 83% of generation renters still believe that. And I think over half of us are planning to buy a house in the next five years. So even though there is this affordability issue, it's clear that there's still this ingrained mentality there that this is what we want. Um, But I think, you know, I guess to sort of finish up, you know, I, it's easy to become quite despondent when you you look at stats like this and think, oh gosh, it's just all, you know, um, what can we actually do about it? Um, But I think there are ways around it. And I think, um, you know, the discussion that we were having, you know, there are alternative options, you know, you can look elsewhere, you can lean on other people for support and and get in. I mean, obviously, Kelvin, your CoreLogic's data shows that, you know, first-term buyers are still, um, buying homes so obviously we're you know we're adaptable we're, we're getting in there somehow um, so I think I'd probably want to conclude by saying that yes we could probably get quite disheartened by um, the data that has just come out but um, I, I do think there are some silver linings there and I think generation renters are quite um, savvy we're good with technology we you know we're looking for other options we want to work our money to work hard for us so um yeah, okay, I'll finish on a positive note. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ritz. And Calvin, last word to you. Thank you, yeah. No, I, I, I actually come out of this sort of with, with optimism as well, actually. I think there's quite a positive sense come out of this that, um, you know, don't forget that, that as I've said, that renting isn't a surefire way to financial ruin. That, um, I'm, I'm encouraged by, so, that, you know, way up if renting is the right option for you. It may well be, but either way, um, you know, all this talk about different investment options and, you know, tech savviness and, and all these things, I, I find that uh, really, really quite encouraging, actually. And, and so, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of hope there and there is change coming in, in terms of types of properties that, that we have in New Zealand. And and um, so that, that's got to be good. And, and we've seen changes to, to legislation around housing already. There may well be more to come. Um, now, this is pretty long term as well, but you know, think about the population bulges that we have and how, you know, sure at the moment, a lot of the property ownership is concentrated amongst people in their 60s, I suppose, 50s and 60s, you know, 20, well, 10, 20 years down the track, you know, that, that sort of bulge works through. And, and so there is big demographic change underway as well. Not much consolation in the next year or two, but um, as I say, I'd be reasonably optimistic from from this talk about that too, that there's other options that people are taking. And, and so... Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's positive. Brilliant. And folks, on that note, just a couple of minutes over, a huge big thank you to our panelists for sharing their personal and their professional views. Um, it is about starting a conversation. It is about looking behind the numbers. And on the face of it, the numbers are alarming. But I think there is cause for uh, optimism as well. So on that note, to uh, everyone out there watching, thank you for joining. We'll continue to come out with uh, really interesting uh, research and insight. To those on the panel, a huge thank you. A thanks again to uh, to T for their support, DLA Piper for your support, and uh, folks uh, have an awesome rest of the day. This is has been recorded, so if you want to go back and watch anything, uh, watch the uh, FSE website for this space. Uh, have a great afternoon uh, and be safe out there. Thanks very much. Thank you.